be no problem. So just FYI. All right. Let's get started. The, the sooner we start, the sooner everyone gets to go home. This is very exciting. Um, so thank you guys for coming to the Common Barbican use cases and options for your OpenStack deployment. Um, I know it, for many of you, is the last day. It is the last talk on Thursday for everyone. Um, so we do appreciate you guys being in attendance so we didn't have to just present to one another again. My name is Sheena Gregson. I'm a product manager at Mirantis. In a very recent previous life, I was the product manager for Barbican at Rackspace. So this talk is near and dear to my heart. Um, with me presenting today are Doug Mendesavo, who is the uh, Barbican PTL, Adam Harwell, who is a core contributor on Neutron LBAS and has been working on the integration between Neutron LBAS and Barbican, um, John Dickinson, who is uh, the PTL for Swift and is going to be explaining the spec for the Swift Barbican integration, and Joel Kaufman from Johns Hopkins, who has implemented an integration between Barbican, Cinder, and Nova. Um, I know that for some of you, if you've looked at the schedule, it looks like we're having a panel. We're actually not. That's a sneaky switcheroo on everyone. Um, they listed me as a moderator, but I was mostly just the person that made sure that we had a slide deck and presenters. So I'm going to happily step off the stage after I give you guys the run through of the topics and let these guys take it away. So uh, today we'll be covering five topics more or less. Um, for those of you who aren't terribly familiar with Barbican, we'll go over some of the basics, terminology that you might need to know, um, what the project's intended to do, how to use it. Um, we'll also go over the common integration libraries. So if you're a developer and you're interested in uh, using Barbican, some ways that you can use it without actually talking to the API. Um, we'll go through three use cases, integrations with Swift, Neutron Elbra Elbas, and Cinder and Nova. Um, we'll talk about a couple of other pieces of information that you may want to look at after, and then we will definitely have time for Q&A or for you to escape quickly. So without further ado, I, uh, I'll hand it off to Doug to go over the Barbican basics. All righty. Thank you, Sheena. Uh, thanks, everybody. So I'm just going to give you uh, sort of the quick five-minute elevator pitch for uh, Barbican, what it is and, and what it can do. Um, so Barbican is a RESTful API for uh, key management and uh, secure storage and generation of secrets. Uh, and we're an official OpenStack project. We're part of um, OpenStack in the Big Tent now. And uh, we sort of designed the, or designed the service uh, from the ground up to be part of OpenStack. So it's got stuff built in, like multi-tenancy. Uh, it's designed for scalability. Uh, so you should be able, it, theoretically, it'll handle hundreds of thousands, if not millions of keys or secrets, as we like to call those. Uh, it's also got a configurable backend architecture. And so what this means is uh, a deployer will have their option to talk to their security guys and sort of figure out what the best option is for deploying Barbican. Uh, and there's some trade-offs on sort of the, the backends that we have. Uh, some of the options include uh, dedicated hardware uh, modules, like uh, HSMs, har hardware security modules that provide sort of high security assurances for the storage of um, your secrets. And uh, we've also got uh, configurable CA backends. One of the cool things that Barbican can do is provision TLS certificates. And so you, you sort of have your choice of what CA to use in the back, um, in the back end for those. Uh, so some terms so that we're all sort of on the same page. Uh, we call uh, basically any kind of sensitive data, we call those secrets. And secrets could be uh, a bunch of different things. You could have um, symmetric keys for encryption, asymmetric private keys, so some like your SSH key or an RSA key or something like that. Uh, you could also have passwords if you wanted to. You could store passwords in here. Uh, and of course, uh, x 9 certificates for uh, TLS encryption and such. Uh, we've also got this concept of orders, which is the way that Barbican is able to provision these things for you. So if you want to provision a certificate, you would submit an order to Barbican, and then Barbican would process that asynchronously eventually would produce a secret from that order, and that's, that's how you retrieve your stuff, is just like any other secret. We've also got a concept of containers. Now, this is just a, a logical grouping of secrets uh, in Barbican. And some of the containers could be, uh, uh, for example, a certificate could be represented by a container if you want to group it together with its private key, um, as well as its 
public part uh, of the certificate and stuff like that. Uh, also, RSA key pairs could be a container. You could have the public key and the private key. And if you choose to encrypt your private key, you could also add a passphrase to that. So you could have all three secrets uh, related to each other in a container. We also got a concept of consumers, which is a way to add metadata to a secret and sort of add information about other systems that may be using that secret. And um, Adam will talk a little bit more about that when, um, when he's talking about the LBAS integration. So um, if you're interested in using Barbican in your application or in your service or something like that, uh, there's a couple of choices for sort of uh, what library you want to use uh, for that integration. And so the first library I want to talk about is uh, Python Barbican client. Now this is uh, your typical OpenStack client. It's going to include a Python API as well as a command line interface. And uh, if you're familiar with any other um, Python dash project client, it's going to look very similar. Uh, we use the Keystone client and Keystone sessions for authentication, uh, so you don't have to learn anything new there. Uh, our latest release is going to be uh, version 3.11, which is available on PyPI now. And it supports secret storage for both the Juno and Kilo release of Barbican. Uh, unfortunately, it's lagging a little bit behind. It does not have some of the features that were released with a Kilo release a couple of weeks ago, but we are actively working on those, so those should be upcoming in a future release. There's a couple of um, advantages and disadvantages that you're going to have to consider when you're thinking about how to integrate with Barbican. One of the advantages of using the Barbican client is that it uses all these um, Barbican conventions that I just mentioned, like secrets, orders, containers, all those things. So you don't have to really relearn. Like if you know Barbican terms, you should know how to use Barbican client after that. Um, also, even though we're lagging, that is where we implement new features first. So if you want uh, some new feature in Barbican, best bet is it's going to be implemented in uh, Barbican client first. One of the disadvantages, though, is that it tightly couples your application with Barbican. So if you decide to use Barbican client, then you are basically saying that your key manager is going to be Barbican no matter what. Now, for some people, that's not a problem. Uh, for some other people, it may be a problem. Uh, for example, people that are working in a government setting where um, the key manager has to comply with certain uh, compliance regimes, uh, like FIPS certification or something like that. Barbican may not be the right key manager in that situation. And so if you find yourself uh, sort of needing alternatives for a key manager if Barbican is not the right solution, uh, we have another library called Castlin. Uh, now this was born sort of a, a, a pattern we started to see with services that were integrating with Barbican where they were putting uh, an abstraction layer of a sort of a generic key manager in front of Barbican clients. So we, we took those, all those interfaces and combined them into sort of a general, uh, you could think of it as like the lowest common denominator key manager. Uh, and we call that Castlin. And it'll uh, allow for uh, different implementations to key managers. Obviously, Barbican is one of them. And uh, the disadvantage to this is that it only implements a subset of Barbican functionality. Um, specifically, certificate provisioning will likely not be available in Castlin. And so with that in mind, uh, I'm going to bring Adam Harwell up here to talk about how he's using Barbican in uh, Neutron Alpass. Thank you, Doug. All right, so why did we choose Barbican? Um, so as I'm sure most of you are familiar, uh, secret storage is not an easy problem. So uh, actually, it's, it's so challenging um, because of the guarantees you have to make in a lot of cases that uh, for Neutron Elbas v1, they actually chose to not have SSL termination rather than try to solve this. So um, fortunately, now with Elbas v2, we do, do, we do um, support TLS termination, and we do that via Barbican. Um, so uh, another thing, besides just the fact that Barbican will store our keys for us, is that uh, the type containers that they have, so uh, Doug talked a little bit about this, um, there are containers that are generic that just hold any kind of secrets, but there are also type containers which hold uh, very specific kinds of secrets with specific names. Um, so in our case, we use a certificate container, and that guarantees us that we'll have several named secrets in it. Um, we'll have the certificate itself, we'll have uh, the private key for it, 
We'll have intermediates uh, that might be necessary and a passphrase if the private key has one. Um, and so that allows us to really conveniently um, keep that uh, in one package so that you, when users are using our service, they don't have to figure things out. It's just, it's right there for them. Um, we're also making use of a rather new uh, feature in Barbican, per secret ACLs, uh, it's access control lists. Um, so normally, uh, when a user puts their secrets in Barbican, only they'll be able to access them by default. So for our service to access them, uh, we actually utilize this feature so that the user can allow our service account to access specific uh, con certificate containers so that LBAS can go in and pull them on their behalf. Um, and also, consumers are awesome, um, or rad, as uh, Sheena has here on my slide. Um, Consumers allow us to do sort of a basic uh, reference counting um, thing so that we can tell, uh, and actually it's a little bit more than that, we can actually link back um, whatever is using uh, this secret container or this uh, certificate container by its URI um, and store that in the metadata for the container. And we can do that atomically when we uh, ret retrieve the data. So when Neutron LBAS gets a user certificate, we atomically register as a con uh, consumer. So there's no chance that the user will accident, well, there's still a chance, but there's a lower chance that a user will accidentally uh, delete a certificate container out from under us, um, which could ca cause problems for us down the line. Um, and it's also, that can also be really useful uh, for like Horizon or other UI integration um, so that you could see right on your secret, um, hey, this is in use by, and actually have a link straight to the thing that's using it. So you could see this secret, can, uh, or this con certificate container is in use by this load balancer, uh, possibly in the future, maybe a firewall. Um, I mean, the, it, it should be really useful for allowing users to keep track of what's using all of their secrets. So uh, our actual use case is pretty straightforward. Um, so we actually allow the user to store their own uh, certificate information, so their own cert and private key uh, in Barbican, either using Barbican's API, or hopefully soon there will be a Horizon UI. Um, uh, we're crossing our fingers on that one. Um, and that, that way the user never has to give their cert to us. They only trust Barbican with it, or their private key. Um, so when they store that in Barbican, they'll get a container ID, which represents all of those se necessary secrets uh, together. Then they'll make a request to our service, uh, Neutron LBAS, and they'll pass in that container ID uh, along with their TLS termination create or update, um, at which point we will use Python Barbican client to go get that data, register, um, and then validate the data and pass it on to our load balancing appliance in the back end, which then uses that certificate data to do H uh, TLS termination. So it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward, but uh, definitely adds a much needed functionality to Neutron LBAS in V2. So um, I'm actually, that's all for me, so I'm gonna pass it to John to talk about Swift's use case. Thanks. So one of the use cases that we have in Swift is, well, generally we're here to store data and lots and lots of it. And when people start doing that, there's new use cases that come into the community. And it's really, to me personally, one of the most exciting things that are like, hey, we're using this, but we need feature X or Y. So that really gives us really great incentive to start working on solving this. So one of the things that has come up a few times in the community recently is how do we store our data, but we need to make sure that for various reasons that it's encrypted while it's stored. And that's a huge, um, that's a huge problem space that you can start trying to, you can, you can tackle and talk about it for years before you actually get around to doing it. So we've uh, constrained the problem space down to this. When somebody stores data in Swift, regardless of the client that they're using or, any, or anything like that, when it is actually persisted to a storage device, the plain text will not be there, neither the, the metadata nor the actual data of the object that's being stored. And this is really nice because the specific attack vector that we're uh, planning on uh, shutting down, the one that we need to account for, 
is what if a hard drive walks out of a data center? Because there's a lot of people who are using Swift today in very sensitive places that have a lot to do with personally identifiable information, specifically medical records and financial records, and uh, then even you've got corporate information that you want to make sure you keep inside of your, your own uh, facility. So it's really bad because if a hard drive walks out and somebody can read the data, that's the kind of thing that for some of these people ends up on the front page of CNN or something like that, and that just cannot happen. So what we need to do is make sure that regardless of the client, they're putting that into, uh, they're, they're encrypting that when it gets onto a drive. So the problem, of course, is that when you're storing hundreds of petabytes of data and billions and billions of objects, key management gets tricky. So that's why we're looking at things like Barbican. So this is something that is um, an in-progress thing. In fact, just, I just came from one of our uh, working sessions where we were specifically talking about some of the outstanding work we had to do this, and we saw a little demo of this uh, working in a, you know, kind of a demo sense uh, yesterday. So we've made some great progress on it, and it's something that's an active area of discussion. So the basic idea is we're saying that we need something out there to provide us the um, uh, the assurances that uh, we can get from a key management without uh, a key management system without us having to deal with securely doing that because it's hard and that's outside of the problem scope of object storage. So that's why we're looking at Barbican and saying this is what we need to use. So we use Barbican. We don't have to worry about what proprietary thing is out there. We can uh, trust that that's going to be uh, just part of the overall ecosystem. So that's where we are. And the basic idea that we're working through is this. At some point, when an account inside of Swift is provisioned, that's just a storage area for where you're going to end up putting your data in Swift. When that is crea uh, created, at that point, we're going to, this is, remember, this is one possible implementation of what we're working towards. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to request a secret to be generated. And at that point, we will store that with Barbican and ask Barbican to generate that secret. So then we can get this, uh, the uh, secret back and store some unique identifier about that. Either we could deterministically ask for it later, or store a key ID or something like that with that account. Later on, a user of that, uh, that Swift account is going to want to store some data. And at that point, we can find the key that we used to store things for this account, um, ask Barbican for that particular key, and we can get the key and encrypt the data. And then when it's persisted to the disk, it's encrypted. Data and metadata cannot be read. Later on, somebody's going to ask for the data back to actually read it. And once they're authorized to do so, then we can request do the same exact process. We request the key back from Barbican. We um, are able to decrypt that and return the plain text back to the user. So the, end, the overall goal here, which is uh, really exciting, I think, is that the end users don't even have to worry about this. You can have any sort of client you need. Um, maybe it's something that's official upstream that knows exactly, hey, the right way to do stuff is to encrypt stuff on the client side before we push stuff all the way down. Clearly, that's going to be the best way to encrypt data. However, that's not the only use case that's out there, and, all the, and you can't always trust all of the clients that are talking to the storage system. So you need to actually make sure that the data is encrypted. So specifically for the problem space that we're trying to solve for, this is something that's going to be really good, and uh, we're working through this now. And the, so far, these kind of patterns that we're uh, looking at here provide us both the high uh, security that we need, but it also is going to be able to continue to scale uh, for the use cases that we have, uh, storing massive amounts of data and things like that. So like I said, um, working on it now, trying to figure out what all the details are and get all those, uh, those pieces worked on. And we expect to have this done soon. I mean, as, as soon as possible, it will be released and, and it will merge into master and, and released in Swift. So I'm hoping that this is uh, done before the Tokyo Summit. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but you know, maybe, maybe after that, when we get to Austin, um, we'll just kind of have to play it by ear and see what, when we have something that's uh, validated, tested, and, and things like this. So it's really great. Uh, we're working with the Barbican team very closely. They've been a pleasure to work with, as well as HP and IBM kind of leading the way on uh, implementing this into, into Swift. So it's been really, it's a really fantastic thing. And every single time I hear about Barbican, 
um, I learned something new, and I'm thinking, this is actually kind of cool. It's like, well, I was wondering how we're going to do this, this particular scalable thing. Oh, we've got Castellan over here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to solve that problem. Or, hey, did you think about this? And, oh, yeah, well, we've got that crypto library over there that's automatically implemented that for you. And it's, it's just been a really great thing because uh, every time you come up, there's like, ah, oh, this, this is exactly what we need. So anyway, I'm very excited about what's going on, and I'm looking forward to it, and I hope that you're able to use that. So with that, I think uh, Joel's next and going to tell you about some stuff at Johns Hopkins. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that uh, APL has been involved in uh, across several different services in OpenStack. Uh, we started in OpenStack as part of the Grizzly development cycle. And the primary uh, situation that we were initially trying to solve was a very similar use case to John's. Um, however, instead of working with object storage, we were interested in securing block storage across OpenStack. So the first place that we started was uh, Cinder and Nova to provide uh, encryption across all of the persistent storage uh, provided by Cinder. So as part of this, we knew that we needed key management, but we really did not want to write key management ourselves at the time because key management is really hard. It's hard to do securely, it's hard to do well. Um, unfortunately, when we started this work, there was no Barbican project. Uh, that was still about mm, three or four months away from the initial uh, prototype that was going to be displayed as part of the Havana Summit in Portland. So what we started with instead was what would become the precursor of the Castellan library. We'd implemented a very generic interface. It supported features like creating and getting keys. And the idea was we didn't know what the form the eventual key manager would take, but as soon as the key manager would be stood up, it would presumably have an implementation that satisfied these various functions. And Barbican certainly uh, provides that functionality for us. Um, there's other compliance regimes like Doug mentioned previously, uh, such as FIP certification that may be required for uh, governments or even financial information or healthcare information. Um, and we want to be able to plug much more high security uh, devices that do satisfy these compliance regimes um, behind Barbican or independently. And Castellan gives us a way to do this. We also have a pluggable backend for Barbican that uses the key management interoperability protocol, or KMIP for short, um, in order to satisfy these various things. So what we're getting out of uh, Barbican or key management, Castellan in general, is secure key storage separate from the data itself. Uh, when we were starting the work, we knew we couldn't store keys either in the Nova database or Cinder database. Very nice for a prototype, not good from the eventual security that you want to have for one of these features. Um, and the other thing is that we needed all of the keys to be accessible across various services. Um, so we couldn't embed this as part of an isolated uh, single service because in our case, as you'll see momentarily, uh, what we actually do is we generate the keys from Cinder and ask for a key to be generated, but Cinder never actually handles the key material itself. Uh, that key is stored in Barbican in this case, and then Nova is retrieving it later on. Uh, in terms of the implementation, we completed the majority of this work as part of the Havana release of OpenStack. There is, uh, at the Hong Kong Summit, a talk entitled Encrypted Block Storage Technical Walkthrough, which explains all of the details uh, in uh, at great length, um, so you can feel free to watch that presentation if you're interested in the work. And we have continued to improve on that since. If you go back and look, there's a lot of command line interface driven stuff in that particular presentation. All of that's been replaced. Now we're fully integrated with the Horizon dashboard uh, as part of the Kilo release. We're also fully integrated with Barbican for all of the key management as part of the Kilo release as well. So the way this, this actually works is the user is going to create a new sender volume. Uh, so that request is going to go to sender. Sender is going to actually take this request, recognize that it needs to create uh, an encrypted volume uh, based on some of the parameters of the request. Sender is going to then ask Castellan or the key manager interface to create an encryption key. Castellan will pass this request on to Barbican, assuming that Barbican is the backend for Castellan, uh, which is the primary backend currently. Uh, Barbican is going to create this key. It's going to return a reference to that key, which is going to be stored as metadata uh, within the Cinder database. So again, Cinder is not actually handling the key material itself. Uh, it simply knows that the key exists. Uh, then later on, when the user is going to attach the volume uh, to an instance, uh, Nova is going to receive this request. It is going to recognize that it is an encrypted volume when it retrieves all of the connection information from Cinder. 
then it will go back and ask for the encryption key from Barbican, again going through the Castellan interface to do so. Uh, the encryption key will be sent back to Nova. Once Nova has it, it will be used or passed to DMCrypt in order to provide uh, transparent encryption and decryption of all of the data being written to and read from uh, the volume. Um, and so to the virtual machine instance, it has no uh, actual knowledge that the volume is being encrypted. It is completely transparent to the end user, um, apart from some additional enhancements that we've added to the Horizon UI in order to indicate with a very simple yes, no, uh, that the volume itself is encrypted. Um, but the user can't accidentally turn any of this off if you're hosting a database and you just simply need to make sure that everything in this database is encrypted. You can turn this on as a configuration option, for example, and there's no possible way that the data would ever be stored on disk um, in its plain text. So with that, I am going to hand it back to Sheena um, in order to uh, cover some additional information as well as handle questions. By handle questions, he means handle deferring questions, just for clarification. Um, I also noticed on here, so uh, we cut down the number of steps significantly. So you'll notice that the last two go 9, 14. Um, I actually am better at counting than that but we were trying to cut down on the number of steps to make it a little bit easier to read, so that's not, uh, that should be 10. Um, so just a couple of bits of information. For those of you who actually accessed the link at the beginning of the presentation, there are two specs that you may wanna take a look at based on the, the presentation today. Um, the Swift spec for the implementation between Swift and Barbican, and the Elbas Neutron Octavia spec, which uses the new uh, load balancing appliance that that team's working on. There's also a Barbican contributor meetup tomorrow, so if you haven't gotten enough Barbican, uh, you can find these fine folks tomorrow at 1.20 p.m., um, and they would be more than happy to talk to you about potentially using Barbican for your project or OpenStack deployment. And with that, we've finished, and it's time for Q&A. If you'd like to run away, everyone's email address is at the bottom. Take a picture, make a run for it. Otherwise, we'll be happy to stay and take questions. A question about the Nova Cinder Barbican integration. Uh, if it does DMcrypt, I assume it's not completely backend agnostic. So, for example, it might not work with Ceph, or does it? Uh, correct. I mean, uh, it will not uh, interoperate with Ceph currently. Um, it is relying on iSCSI connections um, that are formed by the other Cinder drivers. Uh, any future plans to somehow magic this into being? Uh, we would like it to happen. Um, the probably best way to do this is add encryption to uh, much lower in the stack, say to Kimu. Um, we have investigated that possibility. We aren't pursuing it immediately, but it looks like there is some motion on the Kimu development list that this could happen within the next six to 12 months. Um, if someone else does make progress in this area, we would certainly be interested in tying this into the other feature. So I'm gonna just do plus one for that right there. We, we want that integration with Ceph, please. <clears throat> My question though, the next question though is, you know, working, working with John on the encrypted Swift stuff, one of the things we wanna be able to do is when Swift, the key master, hits Barbican and it goes, this key is old, we want to be able to recycle or uh, deprecate that key. And so my question is, how do we do that in the status? Because I want to have a list of keys. One is active, and some are deactivated. They're not deleted, but they're still there. So when I come across a container, and this container is has a deactivated key, I can go, oh, it doesn't have the current active key, so I need to unwrap the container key with the deactivated key and rewrap it with the active key. So kind of how do I do that as far as like status? How do I, how can I look up the key and say this is the one that matches this particular container that hasn't been accessed for a year? You know what I mean? I think that's a great question. <laughs> no, I think, uh, it, it, seriously, it, um, I don't know uh, really what the, what the implementation is going to be because it is not yet written yet. So we can make it whatever it needs to be. That being said, um, one of the th that what you described there is certainly one way that we could do that. Mm -hmm. However, 
Um, I have some concerns with my understanding of how that would work and what the effective effectiveness of that would be, specifically around the scale of, of keys that would be needed. Yeah, and, and we're not talking often, well, like three years is NIST guidance for the keys sure. we're looking at. So John will continue to work with you, Janie, and try to figure this right. all out as we so go along. So one of the things that we're specifically talking about uh, is having some uh, something that might be a little bit more nested. So we have we can lower the scope of the keys. So we have some sort of uh, um, uh, derived keys, or the key derivation stuff, to uh, make that go down. So that maybe we can uh, store a l more limited numbers uh, of keys that can be we can use to derive those little lower level things, say a, a container or an object level thing. Um, and if that's being said, um, I don't know how we'll do key rotation or if we will, because that's hard with that much data, um, re-encrypting all of the data. So Yeah, yeah, I don't want to re-encrypt all the data. I want to do it at a very high, simple sure. layer. You know, so like we'll the encrypt, you know, you, like key encrypting key sort of thing, you might mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. have something like that. Um, this, the short answer, honestly, is it's being written, and that's, uh, that inside of Swift, we're, uh, the way we're doing this is uh, creating something called a key master. Yeah. The key master is responsible for talking to Barbican, Castellan, that kind of, or whatever else is out there. And the key master API is currently being defined. That's what we're, we've been working on this week and uh, we'll be working on over the next few weeks. So, um, and the implementation is certainly not done at all. And the, we want to support various and many different key masters. So the, if you need one that does a particular thing, yeah, we want to enable that. Um, and I hope that we'll have a key master that will support most of what you need and that we'll have the tools available so that you can write one that has their specific requirements of required. Super. Thank you, sir. Had a question about uh, getting the infrastructure we need to have tenant-based logging in OpenStack. So one of, the, one of the things is Manasco right now has APIs to say, oh, as a, as a VM, you can send logs up, but it's requiring the OpenStack um, token as a way to va validate, and we need a secret to be a long-term secret that the VM has kind of per tenant and not something that's going to expire so that the VM can keep sending logs and metrics up into a shared infrastructure, but we can make sure that Coke's, uh, Coke's VMs can't fake Pepsi's data. And so uh, I guess a, a question I had on that is, do we have anybody kind of looking at that infrastructure in integration with Nova to try to have a kind of tenant-based logging password pushed into the VMs and stored in Barbican? There's, uh, so I think this is more, more of a general problem that we've been discussing on the mailing list sort of last week. There's actually a design session going on at the same time as this talk, uh, kind of talking about that. But it's basically how to get, um, how to assign uh, uh, identity to a VM mm -hmm. is, is sort of the base problem. Uh, we're still hashing that out. We don't know what the, what the answer is now. I'm hoping that we'll figure uh, at least a plan forward before the end of the summit. But it's, it's definitely a problem. We're, we're aware of the problem, and we're working on a solution, but we don't have one yet. Oh, okay. Oh, and so which room was that other? Or did you know? The or? other one was in the, the Sakar uh, Design Summit. It's whatever wherever room Sakar was meeting in oh, okay. right now is, is where they're. And we actually sent some Barbican folks over there to, to participate on that. All right. Thanks. If we could go back to the uh, Swift implementation, proposed, I guess, Swift implementation. And um, when we're talking about medical data, we're talking about if you're um, calling up a study, you're going to be calling up not one object, but several in the case of an x-ray, hundreds in the case of an MRI, and potentially thousands in the case of a CT scan. So I'm wondering what kind of, if you have any um, I guess predictions for what kind of overhead that would introduce into the system to you mean as, then as far as it being multiple objects versus right, one object. Yeah. So aside I mean, and we're leaving aside just the overhead of decrypting and encrypting the data, correct? Right. right. I don't anticipate there being significant additional overhead to uh, beyond the the 
CPU needed for doing the encryption decryption. Okay. Uh, the reason is because, um, again, looking at the use case we're storing, so I'm, what I'm about to say is not solving other use cases, but it works sufficiently for this one. Uh, for the use case that we're solving, we are solving the data at rest, keeping drives from walking out and, and exposing that data. So one of the things we're doing, especially to inc improve performance and keep uh, it working at large scale, is we, when we request that token, uh, that key, I'm sorry, uh, that the secret, that's what it is, the secret from Barbican, and uh, use that for encryption decryption, uh, let's suppose that that uh, is stored on a container resolution. So every, you know, the million objects that you have, the million files that you have inside of one container in Swift uh, would be sharing the same key, potentially. Uh, that being said, we can cache that for a while. We can store that internally in the cluster without having to go do that fetch again so that we can have very, very fast access to it uh, for subsequent requests to objects in that container. And basically, in this way it works, it would work very, very similarly to how we do auth tokens and keep those uh, as, as performant as possible inside of Swift. So I don't anticipate a high level of additional overhead, but uh, if you do want to talk more about that, I'd be happy to introduce you to uh, some other people who are more directly involved with it. Sure, thank you. This question is for both the Swift and Cinder implementation. At what level is the key generated? Is it a per tenant? Is it a per VM in the Cinder case? Or is it per container in the Swift case? That kind of thing. Per volume. <coughs> per volume. OK. Yet to be defined. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it, the, the key generation will be done inside of Swift at some logical layer of Swift. So let, that's going to be like a, cust a, a cluster, the whole cluster, or account, or container, or object. And we maybe do something with key derivation and figuring out how to, key, how to do that, rather than um, requ doing a, a, a request for creating a new key every single time. Mm -hmm. um, but the resolution will be configurable on there, depending on that key master implementation. OK. Um, so the, the configuration part is kind of what I was digging out there as well, because for example, our application, we actually uh, might run multiple versions of the app, and for every customer within our app, we're also multi-tenant. So we need to be able to encrypt things per customer, and uh, even to the level of per account within a customer. Yeah, I think that so. makes complete sense. Yeah. I hope to support that totally. And actually, I meant to mention this earlier, but I had someone uh, from the Heat team stop me, I think yesterday or the day before, and tell me that they've got an integration working as well. So it wasn't featured here but these are not the only use cases. Um, we have a lot of folks inside the community making use of Barbican's functionality, and I'm super excited to be a part of the presentation showcasing all the hard work these guys have done. So with, th with that, be free. Thank you guys so much for coming, and have a wonderful rest of the summer.